Welcome to Bayside Midtown, everybody. We are so, so glad that you are with us today. We want you to join in and worship with us. Right, Krista? Yeah. Come on and bless the Lord. Right hey. where you are. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. You give me that joy. You give me that joy. intentional God we serve such a mighty God and we believe in his promises today we believe in your word Lord come on and praise him oh. Oh, 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 oh. all things are working for 
for my good Cause he's intentional Never failing I know that all things are working for my good And he's intentional Yeah This is Pastor Ephraim. Good to see you, Bayside Midtown. Look, uh, I just want to say right off the bat, thank you. 
your prayers, your generosity, your willingness to stay connected with us like this has been so, so meaningful. This has been a challenging time for churches all across the United States. And yet, uh, we've been so blessed because of your connection, your prayers, and your generosity. And I want you to know that, uh, hey, we are back in the building and uh, we have uh, two services uh, going on uh, this weekend. So if if you're watching online, it's, you know, right now, there's two services going on in in the building today. And if you want to be a part of that, uh, you can reserve a seat online. And we're actually going to four services, our regular morning times, eight o'clock, 9.45, 11.30, and 12.55. We have limited seating because of the COVID-19 restrictions, but if you want to be in the building, please go online, reserve a seat, or if you're more comfortable just like this, yes, please stay with us online. There's a lot going on. You know, Bayside Midtown never closed. Uh, We have a class going on by Dr. Mondo, Strongholds of the Mind, specifically experiencing breakthrough if you're dealing with anxiety and weights in your life. And so that class, hey, I think it's already full in terms of on site on Thursday night, but it's being live streamed and you can also catch it online. Speaking of online classes, Dr. David Nystrom is doing a class. If you want to go deeper in the gospels, understanding Jesus, understanding the mission of the church, there's a series of classes that Dr. David Nystrom of Western Theological Seminary is teaching for us online. Get the information and that's unlimited registration. So you want to be a part of that. Also, we've been talking about this. I'm so excited about it. Forward 2020, Church Reimagined. That's right. Bayside Church Midtown, we're putting on our first conference. It's free. It's virtual. November 17th and 18th, uh, we're doing two days, a free virtual gathering of multi-ethnic and reconciliation leaders and learners. I want you to sign up. Yes, it's during the day and into the evening on the 17th and 18th, but if you can't watch it uh, during the day as it's happening, you can watch it later on demand at your leisure, but you have to register and it's free. Come on. On. You got to be a part of this. You are a part of a growing, thriving, multi ethnic church in the city of Sacramento. And if you're watching us and you're someplace else around the country, maybe your church, your ministry is trying to grow and being a church that looks more like heaven. If so, Forward 2020 Church Reimagine, sign up. It is free. And we have people like the mayor of Compton, Aja Brown. We have Pastor Albert Tate, Pastor Ricky Jenkins, Cecilia Williams, the president of the Christian Community Development Association, Dr. Liz Rios of Passion to Plant. Oh my goodness, we have Larry Acosta of City to City, Los Angeles. We, I'm just saying the list is long of my friends, Bob Ballion's friends. We've got professional athletes, y'all. Sign up. This This is going to be amazing and some worship leaders that we're going to announce real soon. So I just want you to sign up for that conference. Would you do that for me? Please, please, please. Now, I want us to go into a time that really goes back to how I started this moment with you, and that is generosity. We are able to have so many ministries going on in the community to the homeless, uh, to those that are in recovery. Uh, the, to youth, uh, small group ministries, so much going on because of your generosity. Do you know we had 10 people come to Christ in our Celebrate Recovery ministry recently? That's because of your generosity and your praying. So I want to encourage you to give. Please give. You can text GIVE to 56316. We want you to continue to be as generous as you can so that the lost can be found, the hurting can be helped, and the broken can be blessed. There's a good word coming up for you now, so I want you to hang in here and listen to God's word. Amen. Father, you're so worthy of all the glory and all the praise. And if creation can worship you, Lord, so will I. God of 
Uh, hey, friends, it's Pastor Ray. It is a privilege to talk to you. This is a global message, the first one we have done in a very, very long time. And the reason we are doing a global message, and you will be hearing from a lot of different people. For example, you'll be hearing from Andy Stanley and Chris Brown and Bob Goff and my friend Sherwood Carthen, who passed away a few years ago, Jason Kane and myself. This is a global message from multiple voices about one subject, the separation of church and hate. The reason we are doing this message is this. America is more divided than I have ever seen. Matter of fact, you got to agree on this. Americans right now can't agree on anything. And I can actually test this right now, wherever you are, just out loud. Here we go. For example, check this out. Coke or Pepsi? Okay. Well, yeah, here we go. Um, another one is this. Dodgers or Giants? Okay. Yeah, everybody, everybody's yelling Giants. Um, I'm a lifelong Dodger fan because there was one giant in the Bible. God wanted him dead. And I'm just trying to obey the Bible. Another one is this, 49ers or Raiders. Okay, everybody's got an opinion on that in Northern California. Trump or Biden, don't say a thing. Okay, um, and here's one, even married couples, toilet paper, does it roll over or roll under? Or a lot of you guys just go, oh, it doesn't really matter. I just set that thing on the floor. Or... Do you open your Christmas presents on all on Christmas Eve? Anybody there? All on Christmas morning. Or you're going, no, I open one on Christmas Eve, the other on Christmas morning, like the Bible says. Nobody in America can agree on anything except for this. Everyone agrees on this. I can't wait until this election is over. I can't wait until the selection. Things have gotten so bad. If I can just talk from the heart here, things have gotten so bad. It is heartbreaking to watch Christians torn apart, families torn apart, our nation torn apart. That's impacting the world being torn apart. I have never seen it like this in all my years. I don't think anybody ever imagined a day like this. Matter of fact, it's so bad. More than four in 10 Democrats or Republicans actually say this, the other parties are so misguided, they actually pose a threat to the nation. So we have decided to do a global message to try to do some healing in the divided states of America, and this may help heal your family, it may help you, and I actually want to do a scripture reading from a crisis time in a nation in the Old Testament. And Jeremiah chapter 29 begins with these words. This is the text of the letter. You already hear the word of God? This is the text of a letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other peoples Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. The nation is in crisis, and this great prophet Jeremiah writes a letter to people in crisis, a nation that's been disrupted and writes these words and the healing words from Jeremiah just could heal our city, some families, a state, the country, and maybe the world. And verse four, here's what he says. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says to those I carried from exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Here's what he says, build houses, settle down, plant gardens, Eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. By the way, that's kind of personal to me. Since COVID, we've had a granddaughter, a grandson, and one of our daughters get engaged. So this is feeling pretty relevant. And then it's, here's a great phrase. Increase in number, do not decrease. Christians, increase in number, do not decrease. Verse seven. Also, this is a great phrase. Seek the peace of and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, 
you will prosper. That's why we're doing this message, okay? And then he says this, yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. He says, watch out. There will be very subtly deceptive religious people in these days. He says, don't listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. What he's saying is this, be very careful to listen to somebody that's telling, that you are telling what to say. And then he says, they are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. God is saying, no matter how bleak things look, I always keep my promises. And then he says this first. So for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you future and a hope. People, that is the word of God. Every single word in here, we bear witness. This is true. Let us be inspired by the word of God. Let us submit to the word of God and let us be transformed by the word of God. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to ask a couple of questions. Question number one is this, how do I change the world? Now, here's the problem right now. Some people have got two answers. In other words, going, hey, I want to be a political church, okay? Let's change the world by being totally absorbed by politics. And every week, did you hear about this? Did you hear about this, okay? Oh, and you know, ditch the Bible teaching, talk about politicians instead of Jesus, and let's be a political church. Or other people are going, I go to the other extreme, which is this, what's this about politics? I thought we weren't a political church. Now, I've written something because I don't want to be, I want to be carefully understand. Our pastors have gone after this. This is a global message to all of our churches and those of you around the world watching. I want to say this very carefully. I'm not saying political positions and platforms don't matter. Values need to be sharpened. Great changes need to be brought about. Great people need to be put in charge. Our country needs to be moved toward being a place where every single child and adult ever created by God needs to be given equal opportunity to thrive regardless of race, economic condition, and background. People need to grow up in a world that is safe. People need to grow up in a world where they can thrive. And that will never happen in times where it's being torn apart. You do not put a country together by tearing it apart and you have been assaulted by both sides and on social media by people that are just trying to tear this thing apart. I told you, we have multiple messages cutting into here. Andy Stanley said something so mature and so wise recently, I wanted you to hear this, check this out. Are you familiar with this? The fundamental attribution Error. Anybody, just raise your hand, anybody heard of the fundamental attribution error? Yes, virtually nobody. Good. I like to know things you don't know because it makes me look smart. So anyway, <laughs> the fundamental attribution error is actually a cognitive bias that we have all been sucked into, especially during a political season. And it goes like this. The co the, this, this cognitive bias causes us to attribute people's behavior to their character. The reason he acts that way is because that's what he really is and that's who he really is. The reason she behaves that way and the reason she believes that way is because that's an indication of who she really is on the inside. But we don't do that when it comes to our behavior. When it comes to us, we attribute our behavior to circumstances and environmental factors. Let me give you an illustration. So he's late, that guy, you know, he's late. That guy at work, he's late. You know why he's late? Because he's lazy and he's irresponsible and he's just disorganized, that's why he's late. And then you're late. And you've never once looked in the mirror. So you know what the problem is? I'm lazy and I'm irresponsible and I'm just disorganized. No, just the, just the opposite for you. You've decided the reason I'm late is because I was helping my kids get ready for school. The reason I'm late, I was on the phone with a friend. I'm actually very organized and very responsible. In fact, I'm so organized and responsible, I'm late, <laughs> right? This is how it works. The fundamental attribution bias happens when we assume that a person's actions reflect what kind of person they really is, what kind of person she is, rather than social and environmental factors. And we talked a lot about this last week. So when it comes to the political scene, this is what it sounds like. The corrupt Democrats, they're just corrupt. You know why they act that way? They're corrupt. That's their character, they're all corrupt. 
the heartless Republicans. You know why they vote that way? You know why they believe that way? Because I've met all of them. I've done research. I know every single Republican is heartless. They're heartless. No, you're corrupt. No, you're heartless. No, you're corrupt. No, you're heartless. No, you've all been sucked into this cognitive bias. Well, clearly something's wrong with these people, right? Something's wrong deep on the inside, right? The Democrats are all socialists. I mean, we know they are. Well, the probably Republicans are all racist. They won't admit it, right? You're not gonna admit they're racist, but we know they're racist. We can see their hearts, every single one of them. Now, I hate to burst your bubble and you're gonna hate me for this. So you hate me now, but then over lunch, you know, kind of think about this. Mature, emotionally intelligent, curious, empathetic people, they don't fall for that but political rhetoric feeds this. And political rhetoric grabs us by the nose and leads us into saying all kinds of silly things and believing all kinds of silly things that just aren't true. And you're better than that. And I'm better than that. I love that phrase, we have got to be better than that. Because the question is this, if you're a Christian at the deepest level of your life, the question I've got to answer is this, how do I change the world? I am here on planet Earth for a short season and then we'll spend billions of years in eternity. How do I live here to make a maximum eternal impact for all of eternity? In other words, how do I make my faith count? How do I make my life count? And I wanna give you one global point and here it is. The problem in America right now is this. Most people are settling for making a point instead of making a difference. Most people are settling for making a point instead of making a difference. Now, if you don't remember anything else out of this message, remember this. It is always easier to make a point than it is to make a difference. Every parent knows this, okay? Lecture your kids, make all the points you want. Nothing ever changes, but you feel better because I'm yelling at my kids making a point. Um, every preacher knows this. We decided a long, long time ago, we wanna be a church that God uses to make a difference. Because the problem with this, really making a difference does three things. Making a difference takes longer. Making a difference costs more, and making a difference requires sacrifice. And here's what's amazing. When I read the Gospels, and I read the book of Acts, and I read the epistles of Paul, they actually give us a road map on how to do it, and the road map, they did four things. The four things they did actually changed the entire Roman Empire, and within 300 years, against all odds, with no resources, no rights, and no power, the Roman Empire embraced Christianity. Think about it, Christians, Christians, without any ability to make a point, toppled a religious system that had been in place for a couple of thousand years. And the way they did that was this. Instead of making a point, they decided to make a difference. Now, realize that making a difference is a whole different strategy than just making a point. So I just wanna ask one question and give you four points. Here we go. Number one is this. The early Christians changed the world by building bridges to people they disagreed with most. They built bridges to people they weren't even supposed to build bridges with. Acts chapter 17, I have been in Athens. I have been up to the Acropolis, okay? Um, I mean, the Parthenon, you, up there, the Apostle Paul shouldn't even be there. He's raised Jewish. It's against his background. Idols weren't allowed. They wouldn't even write the word God. And Paul goes into Athens and he walks right into their world, builds relational bridges with these people, and he does not attack their idols. Hey, see, you guys are all religious. And then instead, he positively preaches the resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay? In other words, they built bridges to people that they disagreed with most. That's, for the most part, not happening. When COVID shut everything down in March, it broke my heart. We um, let go of our Thrive Conference and then we started dreaming some God dreams and said, could we launch this thing globally online? That's why a lot of you are with us from around the world today watching this. And what happened is it blew up to about a half million people, 113 countries, and, um, and it was a privilege on the first day to host a panel on this very subject of building bridges to people that they disagree with most. And Jason Kane, uh, one of our pastors from Blue Oaks, Jason Cade said something so wise, it's the smartest thing I've heard in six months.
check this out. I mean, anything that I am is a result of my parents. I had the yeah. jackpot on who my parents are, uh, people who follow God with their whole hearts. Uh, but that still hasn't abdicated us from experiencing racism, to be quite frank. We were attending a church predominantly white in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, before we joined the church, my dad met with the pastor and says, hey, would my family be welcome here? And the pastor says, of course your family would be welcome here. Uh, but then he made a statement that would shape the rest of my life. And he said, I would never want your son to marry my daughter. Hmm. Now, at the time I was 10 years old, I wasn't thinking about marriage. So the statement was unnecessary anyway, <laughs> but he put it out there just to make it clear that there is a distinction between who you are and who we are, a us and them mentality within the church. And unfortunately, uh, that really created within me some insecurity, particularly around white males, to be frank, that I dealt with until I was 26 years old because I removed myself as much as I could from settings where I wasn't just around my own people. Uh, but at 26, I started working at a predominantly white church and I was able to forge relationships with people. And this is what I found, that when you are in relationship with people, when you're in close proximity to them, you're able to develop empathy mm -hmm. and that empathy eventually leads to unity. Uh, we don't hide who we are. We recognize our differences, but we figure out a way to be empathetic toward one another and hear one another's story. I mean, that's the story of what the gospel is. Jesus got close to us to share our burdens, and that's what we have to do with other people as well. I'm sitting next to Jason Kane at that conference, and when he said, proximity leads to empathy, which leads to unity, I literally was going, I was almost shaken. I thought, this is so profound. It's deeply theological because it's the incarnation. God wanted to connect with us and he created proximity to us. And most people are so divided geographically, uh, politically or whatever else. They have no relationships with people that don't look like them, think like them, vote like them. So there's no understanding and no coming together. Um, the early Christians didn't live like that. They walked into environments with people that were in a very different place and they built relational bridges to people, which then creates empathy and that can create unity. And actually, it's, you know, it's the closer you are to people, the greater your potential for impact. Number one, they built bridges to people that they disagreed with most. Second thing they did to change the world was this. They were constantly at odds with religious people that they agreed with most. Jesus had majority of his trouble put to death because of religious people that for the most part believed almost the same things that Jesus did, okay? However, they had their different approach. And here's what I want to say. I know some of these folks, and so do you. There are Christians that have a Bible, and they use it to beat people up every day. The Bible is supposed to do two things in our life. It's the Word of God. Every word in here is accurate and to be lived and submitted to. The Bible, though, is this. It is a message book. It's our message, what we believe, what we teach. But it is also our method book, which is it tells us how to live, sacrificial giving, connecting with people, all of this stuff. In other words, it's our message book and our method book. And the problem, one of the problems in the American church is this. A lot of folks that lean more conservative, this is my message book, or other people that are on the other spectrum are going, no, 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 this is my method book but I don't take the message seriously because it's politically incorrect. When the Bible becomes both your message, what you believe and your method, what you live, all of a sudden, it is like taking two live wires together and the power of God explodes in your life. Jesus saved his harshest words for people that held to tight doctrinal differences, but they had no love. They were called the Pharisees. They, Jesus was constantly at odds with the religious people that theologically agree with most, okay? There's a third thing they did, and here it is. They didn't try to police the behavior of people outside the faith. How do you change the world? They didn't do it by trying to police the behavior of people outside. You notice, they didn't judge non-Christians for behaving like non-Christians, and unfortunately, Christians are great at this. They've perfected this to the degree it hits TV shows. There's a TV show called The Simpsons. Okay, anybody seen that thing? Yeah, The Simpsons. You got Homer Simpson, and then you had their religious neighbors, the Christians, the Flanders living next door. One day, the Flanders disappeared for a week, and they're all like, where'd they go? And when they got back, they always, you know, Homer Simpson went over and talked to Ned Flanders and said, hey, you guys were gone for a week. I want to know what, what happened. What, you guys okay? And he said, oh, here's his answer. We were at a church camp for a week 
learning to be more judgmental. Unfortunately, that's perception sometimes rooted in some reality. And I want to make a couple statements here about the church of Jesus Christ, whether it is Midtown, Folsom, whichever church you are in right now, the church of Jesus Christ loses its influence on culture to the to the degree it tries to police the behavior of people who are not part of the church. In other words, the church shines brightest when Christians actually act like Christians. That's what it shines bright. That's a novel idea, right? And you never find it with the Apostle Paul. Paul didn't walk into Athens. Read Acts 17. He didn't walk into Athens and condemn them for their idolatry. He walked in, connected with them, and preached the good news about Jesus Christ. Okay? Well, somebody's saying, well, Ray, shouldn't we be concerned about people's behavior? Absolutely we should. That's why we should build relational bridges. That's why we do that. Now, how do you change the world? How do you make the world a better place? How do you explode the Christian faith again? Build bridges to people you disagree with most. That's hard. They were at odds with the religious people they built. They they agreed with most. They didn't try to police the behavior of people outside the Christian faith. And four, I love this. They were committed to more than just being against everything. We've talked about this a lot at Bayside. We want to be known and I want to be known for what we're for, not what they're against. Now, why? Because we just want to be like Jesus. And here is how Jesus put it. Check this out. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. The implication is this. The world is a dark place and it is in trouble. And God has put a light in the world. And guess what? You're it. And then he goes on to say this. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. So so how do I be that light? Okay, evangelical, Bible-believing Christian. How does Jesus say to live so that you will be a light? Here it is. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before others. How does that happen? Right here, check it out. So that they may see your what? expressed opinions. No, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, I think billboards are fine. You can put up billboards all day long for Jesus. It's not going to make a difference. It's just making a point. You want to be a light that attracts people. Then I invade their world, build connections, and build bridges, which is exactly this pandemic we are going through goes You can trace something like this back 2,000 years. The early Christians in Rome. This is actually in a book. Rodney Stark from Notre Dame wrote a book called The Rise of Christianity. And it is the story and tries to answer the question, why did the Christian church go through a tiny little persecuted group of people to toppling a religious system and becoming the dominant influence of the day in Rome? And here is the whole story. It's a nutshell. He said this. He said, a pandemic hit Rome. Sound familiar? A pandemic hit and people were dying in record numbers. And what did all the politicians do? And what did all the nobles do? They all fled the city to the countryside. And what did the Christians do? Christians like, we don't fear death. So they stayed. And hands on care to hurting people, hands on care to dying people. And when Emperor Julian finally returned, he was unable to get paganism going again. Christians were too moral. Christians were too compassionate. Christians were too involved. Christians kept taking care of the poor. Christians kept taking care of the widows. They were the ones doing all the compassion and good deeds, and they were so loved, he could not reignite paganism. In other words, people, if you don't remember anything, revival breaks out, not when Christians become more religious, but revival breaks out when religious people become more compassionate and more caring and more sacrificial and more bridge building. What, what does that mean? Is that Let's outgive every other church in the city. Let's outserve everybody else. Let's shut down and continue to serve our community. Let's go to Mexico and build homes. Let's raise money for things going on in the city. Let's get hundreds more kids back in school and equipped to have a future they could never have. In other words, we will make a point only if we make a difference. Um, my good friend and fellow crazy man, Bob Goff, 
put it like this. Check this out. So I've been on this journey to try to just get more desperate for him, get less comfortable. So we've been just going around the world building schools. We took all the money from this book and just gave it away. <laughs> it's been awesome. And they sold a million of them. So we built our first school in Uganda. And the next school we built was in Mogadishu, Somalia. And you guys, it's just a frightening place. There's no government, there's no police, there's just a lot of El Shabaab. And these guys will shoot you in the face if they see you. And I was walking down the street in Mogadishu, and this guy comes up to me with a machine gun. And I'm like, oh my gosh, all I had with me was my, my phone. And so I asked him, do you know what a selfie is? <laughs> He didn't shoot me in the face. <laughs> oh, you guys find people who creep you out. <laughs> Get on the other side. That is unbelievable. And the impact Bob is having where no other Christian have an impact is in direct proportion his ability to go there and bring the love of Jesus to those folks. Now, that is all one question. How did they change the world? I actually want to ask a second question, and I'm actually going to come and sit down and have a fireside chat and pastor you all. Um, the, I have a deep concern because every single thing I'm reading, Christians and people that aren't Christians um, are in bad shape spiritually, emotionally, and every other way. Um, suicides at an all-time high. And one out of four teenage girls has considered suicide. This is a scary statistic if you're our church because we speak teenager. During this, during this whole pandemic, um, I don't know any of our pastors who worked many hours. Um, and during this pandemic, um, I mean, I was, I was a wreck when this happened. I was handed our first grandchild, a granddaughter, Amelia Ray. And four months later, I'm holding our first grandson, Raymond David. And same thing, I am a, people, I'm a, I'm a sap anyway. I call, I cry at Hallmark commercials. I'm, tears are streaming down my face. And I'm going, what kind of world's he gonna grow up in? And no matter what the conditions are, and too many people try to prepare the road for the kids instead of the kids for any road that happens. How is it that you build people that are strong and not a bad circumstance happen and it wipes them out, wrecks their life, alcoholism and all this kind of stuff comes to in their lives. How do you build people that are emotionally, spiritually vibrant and strong and healthy on the inside and live with joy and don't endure life? They enjoy life and they are so filled with hope that they become change agents in our society. Those are the people we want to build here at Bayside. And folks, I'm the oldest guy on our staff. I'm, uh, I'm probably the old. Matter of fact, you're probably way younger than me, no matter how old you are. I have seen it all. I've been in ministry for over 40 years. I, I mean, almost 50 years now I've been in ministry. And if I can pass to you all, I just want to ask one question. On Wednesday morning, November 4th, the morning after the election, what do you do? No matter what, no matter who wins, no matter how encouraged or depressed you, no matter what, early Christians face tough stuff. My grandkids are, you, my kids are. What do you do to be vibrant and hope-filled no matter what the circumstances are? And what I want to do is I just want to protect you all. I'm a, I'm a pastor. I'm a shepherd. We have a lot of churches. Um, I have a relationship with pastors all over the world now. I just want to protect you. So I want to give you three things to not do. These things are, if you, if this is so, it's going to be, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. These are so destructive that any one of these things can take you to a very bad place, okay? So I want to protect you. I want to give you advice out of God's word. So Wednesday morning, no matter who wins, number one is this, don't get your eyes off Jesus. Don't get your eyes off Jesus. Matter of fact, the prophet Jeremiah, his country went downhill. He was so shook, 
He writes a book titled Lamentations. Doesn't that sound like the encouraging book you want to read? Okay, Lamentations. And in that book, he is venting his frustration. And then all of a sudden, the sun comes up on Wednesday morning, November 7th, a couple thousand years ago. And, and he goes, wait, this I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. The circumstances didn't change. His mindset changed. I'm going to say it again. His circumstances did not change. His mindset changed. His circumstances did not change. His mindset changed. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Write this down. Screenshot this. Maybe put it in every room in your home before that day so you can't miss this. Keep your eyes on Jesus because Jesus is the hope of the world. Um, or let me pretty much what's going on right now is this. A lot of people, Jesus is becoming smaller in what they focus on and something else is becoming bigger. What happens when that happens? We asked Chris Brown that question, took him out on a boat, sent Andrew McCourt with him and a translator, Irish to English, and here's what happened. This is really good. North Carolina. And when I got done, they said, hey, do you want to go over to Joe Gibbs Racing? Are you big into NASCAR? I go, I'm not big into NASCAR, but I like watching cars go around the track, especially when there's a lot yeah, of smoke and turning pieces. Turning left yeah. and turning left and turning left. So we go over, and I have no idea about NASCAR. It is just, it is a huge warehouse. I yeah. mean, it's, I thought we'd go to a little garage. It is football fields of garages. Wow. He's got four different numbers, four different cars that race. Each car has between 30 to 60 cars in development for each one car. I just thought there was like one car and three in case you get it banged up. And so I'm learning about this. And then we come down to all the decals they're wrapping on the car, yeah. the M&M car. M&M on the side, M&M on the hood. And there's a bunch of little stickers all over. And I'm like, well, how much does it cost to get your sticker on a car? Like what does M&M have to pay to sponsor a car? Mm. And uh, at that time, Farmer Insurance had just sponsored a car. And he goes, a six, I think $660,000. Wow. I go, so you have to pay $660,000 a year to get your sticker, you being the main brand. He goes, no, no, that's a race. Every race. Wow. Lower cars, maybe not as high profile, $300,000 to $600,000 to be the main sponsor every race. So my next question is simple. What about the little stickers on the back, the little ones down by the bumper? Yeah. You know, because I want my the church Bayside, to be on it. The yeah. Bayside one. I thought it'd be cool to have a Bayside car going around the track. And I'm like, so can we get Bayside on a bumper? He goes, oh, the little stickers? You can be a little sticker for about $75,000. He goes, but they're placed on the back. They're placed on the bumper, places that don't get a lot of camera time. And that's exactly where we are politically today. Hmm. That's exactly what Jesus did in the temple. Christian if you ever get confused where your sponsorship lies, um, mm -hmm. you've got a major issue with your priorities. You, ha you are made in the image of God. Not only did he create us, he sent his son to die for us just to buy us back. We are stamped with his decal. It is a Christy in. The rest of my life, I'm supposed to show Christ and loving others. Yeah. Now it's okay to be a fisherman. It's okay to be a Patriot fan. It's okay to be a Dodger fan. It's okay to be a Democrat. It's okay to be a Republican. We got stickers for a lot of other things we're passionate about, but you'll never see in NASCAR, the little stickers are never put on top of the M&Ms. Never, because that's the sponsorship. That's the sponsorship. And over the next two months, our Christianity is gonna be stretched for a lot of people because their political sticker is gonna get in the way of the image of God they're made in. Jesus will die that week. He wasn't afraid of Rome. He wasn't yeah. afraid of speaking about politics. You say, well, if he said something wrong, Rome would have killed him. He came to Jerusalem to die. Mm -hmm. He didn't fear him. He was just going to choose what to die for. And that final week of his life, when they said, you talk about politics, he goes, I, I'm going to come here and die for people, not politics. Yeah. And we will have Christians, unfortunately, in the next couple months that will sacrifice their character on the hill of politics, not people. And when your politics ever gets in the way of showing love to people, regardless of what party they're from, oh, yep. regardless of what point of view. If your politics ever gets in the way of loving someone because of your response, because of your answer, yeah. then you've got the wrong stickers on the hood. Wow. And, and, and that's what Jesus did that last week. So what do you do Wednesday morning? Number one is 
keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't get your eyes off. Don't let anything ever again get your eyes off Jesus. Second is this. Don't let anything divide you. During, here, whether you're married or at church, when tough times hit, run to your family. Don't run away. And number three is this. Don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. I love where this starts. He says, this I recall to my mind. Nobody lives well or loves well or leads well until they think well. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. And what he's basically saying is this. If you're looking at that and you're writing on something, take the word hope and circle it to mind. And what he's saying is this. If I put something in my mind, I will have more Hope, very good. In other words, hope is a result of some things you put into your mind. And so he's taking the promises of God and the love of God, and he's putting those back in his mind. Maybe the best way to describe it is this. If you've ever been to Manhattan, you've seen this. This is the Chase Manhattan Bank. This thing is just massive. It is a 60-story skyscraper. It's huge. Part of the story you may not know is this. During construction, they discovered they were building it, and part of the foundation was actually quicksand for the 60-story skyscraper. And, it, and they, if, they didn't, if they didn't solve this, it was going to sink, it was going to topple over, and it was going to destroy part of Manhattan, okay? And they had, well, what do we do about this? Do we dismantle it? And then they tried something brilliant, and this is really important. They sank pipes deep underneath that into the foundation. They sank pipes in there, and through those pipes, they injected a solution of sodium silicate and calcium chloride. And they inject it and get this, in just a few days, that turned that quicksand into solid watertight sandstone. They finished the building and it has been safely standing ever since. That is exactly what Jesus says in Matthew chapter seven. If you will take the words of scripture and inject them into your life. Here's what will happen. If you inject this into your life, it will decrease anxiety. It will increase stability. It will draw you closer to God. It will give you strength to resist temptation you know you had. It will help you make wise decisions. You will be comforted. Inject this into your life. You will be comforted when you're discouraged and it will impact every single relationship you have. Maybe the best way to wrap this up is by showing you my favorite clip of all time. This is Sherwood Carthen's last message at Bayside. And it's almost like he saved the best for his last message. And I remember, I can tell you where I was sitting on this Sunday night in the stands taking notes on Sherwood. And what he said was so profound, I thought this, you just watch this over and over again, it'll prepare you for anything. And he talks about the power of injecting God's word. And so welcome to the last part of the last message Sherwood Carthen ever delivered at Bayside. Let God use this to touch your heart. Check this out. The word has to be in you. And we've got to get an army of believers, a body of people who have memorized scripture, who have meditated on scripture till it becomes part of who they are. So that when you go through situations, you won't be looking for a word, you'll have a word. I can't get a witness in here. See, 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 if we had been in the word, we'd realize that Isaiah 26 and 3 says, I'll keep you in perfect peace, they whose mind is stayed on me. We know that Nehemiah, Nehemiah 8 and 10 says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. We know that Psalms 34 and 19 says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. We know that Psalms 30 and 5 says, his anger isn't but for a moment, but his favor lasts for a lifetime. Weeping may endure through the night, but joy is coming in the morning. If we were in the Word, we'd know that. The power of God is always released. When you let go of discouragement and replace it with hope. And what I want to say is this. And when you do that, you discover that COVID can't stop compassion. And disruption can't stop discipleship. And a pandemic can't stop your purpose. And as my friend Ricky Jenkins says, and for God's sake, politics can't stop the power of God working in your life and in our future. All of God's people said, 
Amen. I want to send it back to the people on your site that minister to you. Thanks so much for being part of this global message. We love you all. God bless. Hey, that was a great word. I hope that you were equipped and empowered by it. And so I I just want to say thank you for uh, being a part of this online worship experience. And uh, we're just going to keep trusting God, keep connecting with one another, because this moment we are in right now will not always be. There is something that God has for you. There is something that God has for us on the horizon, on the other side of this season we find ourselves in. The best is yet to come. God bless you, and thanks so much for being with us.